Well, as for funding the current seats, I just wanted to welcome you all. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. Thank you all so much for registering and for coming out this evening. I just have some quick housekeeping notes. One, if you could uh, either turn off or silence any of your devices that you brought with you. I also wanted to make you aware that we now have uh, T-coil hearing loop technology in several of the rooms, including this one in the library. If you have a T-coil enabled um, hearing aid, then you can switch on the T-coil and your hearing aid will connect directly to the system that's much clearer. Uh, that also means that any questions or any speaking, we ask that you do that through the mic. So we have a microphone set up for post-discussion um, Q&A. Uh, if it's difficult for you to get to the mic or you just prefer not to, for any reason, you can wave uh, either myself or my colleague Jamie over uh, and we will bring the mic to you. I also wanted to thank Labyrinth uh, for being here to sell books. We have uh, both of Dr. Benjamin's most recent books, Race After Technology and Captivating Technology, the longer title. Um, and the, those books are 30 and 20. And then we also have uh, Dr. Gloud's uh, Democracy in Black for sale. So they both agreed to sign the books afterwards. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, so I hope you buy some books. Uh, for this evening's program, um, I also wanted to let you know that we are res recording this program and hope to have it available soon. Uh, last August, Dr. Benjamin wrote to the library and Labyrinth Books to ask if we would be interested and able to uh, host her book launch in September 2019. All were included in the email responded immediately with a resounding yes. Uh, I promised Dr. Benjamin that I would keep this short. Uh, so not only is she a sociologist and an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, um, the primary focus of her work being in the relationship between innovation and equity, but she is a much loved, deeply admired associate professor. Everyone who's had the pleasure of uh, her teaching will say, I love Ruha. Um, and uh, to see a list of her many accomplishments, I would suggest and accolades, I would direct you to her website. We're also very uh, grateful to be able to have Dr. Eddie Glaub, Jr. Um, he's the chair of the Department of African American Studies and the James X. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton. Uh, many in the audience will also have seen him on MSNBC and CNN, but to his students and colleagues, he is a deeply committed and thoughtful friend and mentor. We are honored to have them both here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruha Benjamin and Dr. Ruha. get started. So Princeton Public Library, I have to say that this uh, institution, this library is one of the reasons why I feel at home in this town where I otherwise would not. Um, within the first week, I looked at the programming of the library and thought, I can do this. I can, I can live here. This is the programming uh, that says something about the community. And I'd love, love to thank um, Kim, Janie, and everyone who works at the library for making this place feel like home. To Labyrinth as well, another sort of institution in our town. Um, and then my beloved Department of African American Studies, without which really these works would not happen. I know that if I was not in this department, I would not have been able to produce this for many, many reasons. And so I want to thank my chair, Eddie Loud, and Dion Worthy, who puts it all together. Can we give them a hand? Join me now in acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the, the Lenape Nation. We acknowledge that academic institutions, indeed the nation state itself, was founded upon and continues to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. With that, I often like to start by acknowledging that we are in community. You all, all are just not sort of here for me, but for connecting with one another. And so I want you to just take an opportunity to introduce yourself to your neighbor. If you already know them, that's cool. Um, <laughs> and in that introduction, maybe just share, just a minute, just share um, your favorite technology, whether it's an app or something else. And I also want you to guess who the author of this quote is, if you know. So go ahead and introduce yourself.
Any guesses? Yes. MLK. And we want to think about how the conversation that we're having tonight is part of a longer tradition of thinking about the triple evils of materialism, militarism, and racism. And so we think about automated weapons. That's one end of a pole of automation that in many ways is reinforcing, de deepening, speeding up forms of racism. And so I want to link this conversation into this longer tradition of thinking critically about technology in relation to these other social justice issues. And so when we think about tech, there's a lot of buzzwords that sort of go along with this conversation. The one that is um, more rare in terms of um, sort of framing technology is the questions of power. And uh, a story that I'll, brief, brief story I'll just convey is when I was walking through the airport, a North airport a few months ago, going to speak to STEM students in Southern California, I walked by two men and one said to the other, and of course I was being nosy as usual, one said to the other, I just want someone I can push around, dot, dot, dot. And I didn't quite know, I didn't stay for the end of that sentence, but I filled it in anyway. And can end in many different ways. I just want someone I can push around in terms of hiring. You're thinking about going through applications, who you want to work with. You can think about it in the context of dating or marriage. I just want someone I can push around. But the point is that that sentence could end in many different ways. And this kind of unvarnished expression of a particular mode of power, power over others, a dominant mode of power, has been given um, new license in the contemporary era. It's never quite gone away. That's not the point, but people feel freer to express this particular mode of power. And so when we think about technology, that's the, the, the questions of power we need to put in the center. But we also need to understand that that particular theory or mode of power is not the only form of power, right? And so we want to think about what kinds of power do we want to engender power with others, empowering, horizontal forms of power that can counter this dominant mode of power. We think about the history of technology and what kind of power was exercised, is exercised through the most popular forms of technology. We go back to this uh, ad in 1957, Mechanics Illustrated. Here you have this article in which we're promised that the robots are coming. When they do, you'll have a host of push button servants. And in case if the font is too small, in 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. And we could spend an hour just dissecting this ad. There's so much going on here. Um, a few things I just want to point out. One is that it's 1957. So we want to situate this particular vision, technological vision within the social milieu in which there are many th things that are changing in terms of gender, in terms of race, so that those who were ready to dress you, comb your hair, and serve you meals in a jiffy were like, no, not anymore, right? Whether that be wives, whether that be domestic servants, and so in this case, technology becomes an expression of particular desires to be served. But there's one word that stands out to me in that. We'll all have personal slaves again, which tells you who the ad is for, right? Certainly not those who are the descendants of those who were slaves the first time. And so also in this is not only the inputs of these, these robot servants in terms of the social dimensions of what they were supposed to do, but also the outputs, who it's for, the imagined public for whom this ad, this article is being written. And so here's just one example of thinking critically about how the technology becomes an expression of particular forms of power, but also reinforces forms of power, so the inputs and the outputs. Often when we, I bring up these issues, the, the default sort of response or question is, maybe we just need to diversify the tech workforce. Maybe that'll help, right? And it's not that diversity in the workforce is not important, but that, that cannot be a placeholder for much more robust forms of change and critical questioning, right? And so in this case, I show you an article about a computer scientist 
who was um, also creating his own app. And you know, we have these digital assistants, the series of the world, and, and most of the voices for those are white feminine voices, are they not? That's what we are socialized to expect and want. In this case, this computer scientist, he wanted to change that up a little. He wanted to have a black masculine voice as the voice of his AI, his AI app. And he realized after doing, I think, some market research that no, the market would reject it. And so as much as he wanted to embed through his own vision and desires a different um, confluence of race and gender in, in his um, uh, you know, automated system, the larger social and cultural milieu it matters in terms of what individuals might want to do. And so we have to think beyond individual intention to change and think about how these technologies are situated in a wider milieu. And in this case, it's not enough just to ask for or to demand a diverse tech workforce. All right, so moving on. Last example before I get into sort of the, the meat of um, the trailer of the book. Go to your Google search thinking about the wider milieu. Type in unprofessional hairstyles <laughs> or professional hairstyles. And what you'll see is a pattern search results, right? Typically black hairstyles on your left, right? White on the right, but with some exceptions, of course. Queen Bee over there on your right. The lady from Hunger Games on your left, you know? And so just because there are exceptions doesn't mean that the larger pattern doesn't hold. But in this case, what we're talking about in terms of code and judgments might seem funny, cosmetic. But this is sort of one end of a much wider set of practices in which judgments about whether you are able to get a loan, whether you are going to get that financing, whether you're going to be hired for that job, whether that treatment is going to work these much more consequential arenas in which automated systems are also being employed that we want to think critically, not just at the level of search results, but almost every arena of our lives. And so now I'm going to sort of shift to my notes a little bit and give you the book trailer in case anyone has to leave early, you kind of know what the, the nuggets are. So there are three main points that I hope you walk away with after reading this. The first is that racism is productive. Not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods, and outdated, rather than innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, productive. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology are co-produced. They shape one another. More and more people are accustomed to thinking about the ethical and social impact of technology, but this is only half of the story. Social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact of technology, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and an output of tech and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and control. Racism, among, among other axes of domination, helps produce this fragmented imagination. Misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded 
injustice, and joy. We can't only critique the underside, but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desire even for social domination. I just want someone I can push around. So that's the trailer. Let's get to some examples. Starting with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it also so shows you incidents as red dots on a map, so you can avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. You're probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong <laughs> in the age of barbecue Becky <laughs> calling the police on black people cooking, walking, breathing out of place? It turns out that even a Stanford-educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area, no less, is an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting, too, that the app, Citizen, was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. What's most important to our discussion, I think, is that Citizen and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact on society, but also about how social norms and values shape what tools are imagined in the first place. Who and what are fixed in place so that others are free to tinker and experiment with science and technology? And how should we understand this duplicity of tech fixes, purported solutions that nevertheless reinforce and even deepen existing hierarchies? One formulation that's hard to miss is the idea of racist robots. A first wave of stories seemed shocked at the prospect that, in Langdon Winner's terms, artifacts have politics. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address these default settings of racist and sexist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we now face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. The combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new Jim Code. Innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. This riff off of Michelle Alexander's analysis in the new Jim Crow considers how the reproduction of racist forms of social control and successive institutional forms entails a crucial socio-technical component that not only hides the nature of domination but allows it to penetrate every facet of social life under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is related to a number of other, we could call them cousin concepts, by Brown, Broussard, Daniels, Eubanks, Noble, and others. So uh, just a quick example to illustrate this relationship between Jim Crow and the new Jim Crow. What you see on your left is a flyer used by developers in the neighborhood that my grandma um, bought a house in, in the 50s and where my dad grew up and where I grew up, in Levert Park, Los Angeles. Before it became a predominantly black neighborhood, they were settling the area with white households. And this flyer essentially is promising white home buyers that if they buy a home, their property, well, their, in their investment will be secured because there are beneficial restrictions. That is racially restrictive covenants that will not allow black home buyers to come. This is a kind of old school targeted advertisement, right? The kind you see on the margins of your Facebook. Nowadays, if someone's selling housing, they can actually log onto Facebook and create an ad that will exclude black home buyers or other groups that they don't want to see their ad. And so they might go on and then see these options. I'm selling, I'm trying to uh, sell people, uh, target the ad to people wanting to buy a house and then it would let you exclude certain ethnic groups. It would let you exclude or include certain age groups, people who have kids, many different protected groups. And in the last year, this has come under fire. Um, Facebook has settled and is now changing um, th these options. But just in the last week, there's a group in DC that's suing the housing, um, about the realtors who are trying to do this and also going after Facebook. And it's the first kind of civil rights suit around the new Jim Code, we could call it. 
the point is that there's a continuity. Whereas before, you could see the people excluding you, right? See the realtor or the housing developer who's like, no, no Negroes may apply, right? Now it's to the back door that you don't even know when you're being excluded because you don't see the app. And so this is part of this relationship between coded bias and imagined object objectivity that we want to think more about. Fortunate for us, there's a lot of people sort of coming together to think critically. And I give you some of the other books that I would suggest digging into besides mine. I think about this growing field as race critical code studies. And again, this approach is not only concerned with the impacts of tech, but its production, and particularly how race and racism enter the process. As we think about how anti-blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, in the book I write about four dimensions of this that fall along a spectrum. And at this point in the talk, I would normally dive into each of these with examples. But for the sake of time, I'm going to shift gears to focus on this idea of abolitionist tools for the new Jim Code, thinking about what we can, how we can respond collectively. Like abolitionist practices of a previous era, not all manner of getting free should be exposed. Recall how Frederick Douglass reprimanded those who revealed the routes that fugitives took to escape slavery, declaring, that these supposed white allies turn the upper underground railroad to the upper ground railroad. Likewise, some of the efforts of resisting the new Jim Code necessitate strategic discretion, while others may be effectively tweeted around the world in an instant. For example, 30 minutes after proposing an idea for an app that converts your daily change into bail money to free black people, Compton-born black trans tech developer Dr. Courtney Zeigler added, it could be called abolition, a riff on the word abolition and a reference to a growing movement towards divesting resources from policing and prisons and reinvesting in education, employment, mental health, and a broader support system needed to cultivate safe and thriving communities. Calls for abolition are never simply about bringing harmful systems to an end but also envisioning new ones. After all, the etymology includes root words for destroy and grow. To date, Appalachian has raised more than $137,000, that money being directed to local organizations who have posted bail freeing at least 40 people. When Zeigler and I sat on a panel at the Allied Media Conference last year, he addressed audience questions about whether the app is diverting even more money to a bloated carceral system. But as he clarified, money is returned to the depositor after a case is complete. So donations are continuously recycled to help individuals like an endowment. That said, the motivation behind ventures like abolition can be mimicked by people who don't have an abolitionist commitment. Zeigler described a venture that Jay-Z is investing millions in called Promise. Although Jay-Z and others call it a decarceration startup, because it addresses the problem of pre-child detention, Promise is in the business of tracking individuals via the app and GPS monitoring, creating a powerful mechanism that makes it easier to lock people back up. Following criticism by the organization BYP100, we should understand that Promise exemplifies the new Jim Code. It's a dangerous and insidious pre precisely because it's packaged as social betterment. Similarly, there's growing buzz around using virtual reality for, quote, immersive career and vocational training for prisoners to gain job and life skills prior to release. And here I'm hoping to entice some of the students in the room, especially to research companies like innovative, innovative prison systems who use VR as a tool for rehabilitation. At first glance, we might be tempted to count this as an abolitionist tool that works to undo the carceral apparatus by equipping former prisoners with valuable skills and opportunities, but only if we ignore the deeply discriminatory context that it conspires against the formerly incarcerated. So the question becomes, who is actually profiting from VR training for prisoners? And how does this technical fix subdue the call for more far-reaching aims, such as to weaken the carceral apparatus or to reimagine how the labor market operates. In fact, VR is more likely employed to generate greater empathy for officers than, say, for people who are the object of police harassment and violence. According to a report geared to law enforcement, 
VR is, quote, public rela a public relations tool for strengthening public opinion of law enforcement because the technology allows a user to virtually walk in a cop's shoes. Police agencies could bring VR into classrooms and community centers so the public can experience firsthand the challenges police officers face on patrol. So then if even these empathy machines are an extension of the carceral state, what do abolitionist tools look like? What is an emancipatory approach to tech entail? One of the most heartening developments is that tech industry insiders themselves have increasingly been asking these questions and speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion, the state-sanctioned racism and militarism. For example, thousands of Google employees condemn the company's collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective. And a growing number of Microsoft employees are opposed to the company's ICE contract saying that as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft, Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. This kind of informed refusal is certainly necessary as we build a movement to counter the new Jim Code. But we can't really wait for worker sympathies to sway the industry, and I can say a little bit more about that. In a different vein, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Tech Project offer a more far-reaching approach. The former brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the latter develops and uses tech rooted in community needs, offering a support system to grassroots networks doing data justice research, including what they call discotechs, which stands for discovering technology. These are multimedia mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. And I'll just quickly mention one of the concrete collaborations that's grown out of Data for Black Lives. Last year, several government agencies in St. Paul, Minnesota, including the police department and the, and the public school system, formed a controversial joint powers initiative called the Innovation Project, giving these agencies broad discretion to collect and share data on young people with the goal of developing predictive tools to identify at-risk youth in the city. There was immediate and broad-based backlash from the community with the support of Data for Black Lives Network. And in 2017, a group of over 20 local organizations formed what they called the Stop, to, Stop the Cradle to Prison Algorithm Coalition. Eventually, the city of St. Paul ended up dissolving the agreement in favor of what they call a more community-based approach, which was a huge victory for the activists and community members who had been fighting these policies for over a year. Another abolitionist approach to the new Jim Code that I'd like to mention is the Our Data Bodies um, Digital Defense Playbook, which you can download for free online and make a donation to the organization if you choose. The playbook contains in-depth guidelines for facilitating workshops and group activities, plus tools, tip sheets, reflection pieces, and rich stories crafted from in-depth interviews with communities in Charlotte, Detroit, and LA. They're dealing with pervasive and punitive data collection and data-driven systems with the aim, in their words, of engendering power, not paranoia, when it comes to technology. And although the playbook presents some of the strategies people are using, in the spirit of Douglas, um, they also admonish against making these all um, exposed and visible, about the upper ground railroad, saying that, that not everything that the team knows is going to be um, published. Detroit-based digital justice activist Tawana Petty put it like this. Let me be real, y'all get in the digital defense playbook, but we didn't tell you all the strategies and we never will because we want our community members to continue to survive and to thrive. And so the stuff that's keeping them alive, we keep it to ourselves. The fact is data disenfranchisement and domination has always been met with resistance and appropriation in which activists, scholars, and artists have sharpened abolitionist tools that employ data for libera liberation. From Du Bois' modernist data visualizations to Ida B. Bar uh, Wells Barnett's expert deployment of statistics in the red record, there's a long tradition of employing and challenging data for black lives. In that spirit, the late legals and critical race scholar Derek A. Bell encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals. He insisted that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be. And so one of my favorite examples of a racial reversal in the kind of Bellian tradition is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-black logics 
embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white-collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they enter high-risk areas to encourage, quote, citizen policing and awareness. <laughs> Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. <laughs> and the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical if we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. With that, I'm going to kickstart our conversation with a short two-minute clip from the show Better Off Ted. The episode is called Racial Sensitivity. As it illustrates how the new, uh, it illustrates this idea of the new Joe Code in a very simple but provocative way. Sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. <laughs> sensors in the lab? Oh, yeah. We replaced all the sensors in the building with a new state-of-the-art system that's going to save money. It works by detecting light reflected off the skin. Well, Lem says it doesn't work at all. Lem's wrong. It does work. Although there is a problem. It doesn't seem to see black people. <laughs> because it's not targeting black people, it's just ignoring them. They insist the worst people can call it is indifferent. We never show that they're white at all. Great black men in the Of course the white guy's got to go. Veronica? Oh god, this looks way too aggressive. No, it's okay. I think I know why you're all here. Well, most of it. <clears throat> um, I have something prepared. Um, Veronica, you are a terrific boss. Thank you, ma'am. I'll take it from here. Let me start by apologizing on behalf of Meridian for this inexcusable situation. <laughs> I laid in the Veronica pretty good. I figured it was my only shot, so I took the collection off. Uh, sounds great, ma'am. Sounds like you gave the company a really strong message. Oh, yeah. She said they're working 24 7 to make things right. Can you believe this? I know, isn't it great? We all get our own free white guys. You like it? Yeah. Hey, that's the best. It anticipates everything I need. Plus, you picked up my drag queen. Oh, and we got this king guy in there. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my guy sucks. Well, maybe they're just not using yours, right? Yeah, maybe it's on you, dude. Shut up, Stu. We have the worst black guy. <laughs> it turned out Lem had also been thinking about the money issue. And he put together some interesting numbers to show him. And then, we all went to speak to management in a language they could understand. Within a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. And so, if the company keeps hiring white people to follow black people to follow white people to follow black people by Thursday, June 27th, 2013, every person on earth will be working for us. Right. 
and we go to the party. All right, that's it. You guys okay? Yeah. Yeah. So good, I don't know what to ask. <laughs> but I think it might be good to begin on a more personal note. Um, how you came to this subject. You're a sociologist that studies medicine and science and technology. Um, it's a particular journey. Mm -hmm. so tell us how you came to this particular subject. Um, you know, there's different ways to tell um, a story like that or to try to make connections um, that might seem more seamless and inevitable than it really is. But one, one way that I think about why I'm studying what I do is um, because I'm very stubborn and I don't like when people tell me that I can't do something. And so because science, technology, are often put in a bubble as if it's sort of asocial, apolitical. We don't get to question it. Um, for that very reason, I think it grants it a lot of power. These fields a lot of power. And we are not socialized to question it as much as I think we need to. And so, for example, as a sociologist who studies this, I often get, especially when I was focused more on the life science ends of things, um, are, you know, did you study science in college, or did you study biology or genetics in college? When I didn't see my peers who were studying housing or the economy at being asked, you know, um, were you a politician in a previous life, or were you an economist? Because it seemed like that was more accessible to the social sciences and the sociology. And so it's this way in which science technology are um, seen as removed from our everyday life and that only some people are allowed to think about it and question it, that makes it appealing to me. And then, more personally, you know, when I first started, it was looking at different fields of medicine, specifically obstetrics and looking at childbirth. And, you know, it was, it was the power that was granted scientific authority in this very um, vulnerable uh, time of women's lives in which they weren't allowed to question that authority when it was their bodies that was growing this human being. And so thinking about how our lived reality gives us certain kinds of knowledge and experience that should be part of the conversation, whether it has to do with childbirth or whether it has to do with the fact that we all have these apps and these phones and we, there's a certain relationship to these things that we should have the, we should be empowered to question, right? And so that's what makes it appealing to me and, um, why I think I'm, I've been sort of taking a, a set of questions around power and inequality and training my attention on different fields. So starting with medicine and, and the life sciences and now the data sciences and technology. At the heart of it, it's the same sort of kernel of questions that I'm sort of putting as a lens onto various fields of action. So the synthesis of lived experience actually opens the text mm -hmm. in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. right. So you, you begin this, the, the, this, this extraordinary book, and you almost buy it by the <laughs> uh, you, you begin this extraordinary text with talking about being at your grandmother's house just off of Crenshaw Boulevard in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. And that kind of sets the stage for the way in which you uh, unpack the new, new Jim, Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Talk about why you begin there yeah. and how it opens up argument yeah it actually you know the preface grew came much later in the process and it came after I was engaging this organization called the stop LAPD spine coalition which is a grassroots organization in Los Angeles and they produced their own research by interviewing members of the community about their experiences of policing and surveillance and produced you know published documents and one of the things that I took away after reading that was their emphasis that people know things. They know what it feels like to be watched. And that is a form of knowledge that needs to be part of these conversations of policing and surveillance and tech, tech innovation. 
And so from there, they kind of put a mirror up to me and made me think about what it was like to grow up in the very neighborhoods that now they are researching and how a, a, a everyday experience on Fourth Avenue was the rumble of those police helicopters up to today that you just get used to. Everyday experience of walking up the block to school and seeing kids lined up the fence and getting patted down, so normalized. So th these are the kinds of policing that are in your face, right? Um, and so for me, it was thinking about the continuity there between the stuff that's so obvious to the more insidious forms of being watched that are about cameras and facial recognition and predictive policing and risk scores and so on. And so it's trying to draw a connection to the very populations who have the experience of the more obvious forms of surveillance of policing really being left out of the conversation about all of these high tech innovations when it comes to not just um, police work, but almost every arena of social life. And so that's the, the connection. You, you, you make this interesting move. You, you, you say that race is a technology. Mm -hmm. And at first, when I first read it, I think it was John. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by, by, by that? Yeah. I mean, if part of it is to think about what we are taught race is and how it operates. And the dominant mode of thinking about race and racism as, as an interpersonal um, encounter and where um, forms of you know, antipathy and feeling and emotion um, are expressed through, for example, racial slurs or microaggressions. And all of that is true and right. But by thinking about um, race and racism at only at the level of emotion and ignorance, um, that we, we kind of forget that these set of practices um, we choose to exercise and employ. We use it to do certain things, to get certain things. And so by talking about it as a technology, which means in the generic sense of as a tool to do things and make things in the world, it brings that element back into the conversation. So then we can ask questions like, who benefits from the employment of this tool in this arena? Can we use this tool to do something else that it wasn't intended to do? And so it just gives rise to a different set of questions by placing that lens of technology and praxis onto what we often um, think about as um, you know, hurt feelings and mean words. Um, which still happens, um, but I want us to become a, make the, the practical and praxis aspect of racism a little more um, evident. So, so this, this, this is really helpful in the sense that it, it opens up how uh, you, you listed those elements in the, in the chapter, mm -hmm. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you gave the titles of the chapters, mm -hmm. and so it would be really good to kind of think about, mm -hmm. like, say something out loud about what they mean. What do you mean by engineered and equity? Sure or default discrimination. I love the chapter on COVID exposure. It's really, it's really striking. Thank so you. say a little bit more about sure. engineered inequity. What do you mean? By sure, that? and I should say that like that, the, the, the chaptering in that way grew out of feedback that I got from colleagues who were reading earlier drafts and were like, you're, you're it's, it's, you need to make more distinctions about the way that technology and race are related to one another. You can't just call everything racist, Ruha. Um, so I was like, why not? Everything is racist. <laughs> and so it was through feedback that like colleagues were like, no, you need to make some finer distinctions. And I was like, all right, all right. But that's what sociologists love to do, right? And so that's why I'm an African American studies. Um, so, but then I went ahead and sort of tried to make some distinctions. And the way that you can think about it as a loose spectrum from engineered inequity, which are those ways in which um, tech are used rather explicitly to, to recreate hierarchies and to create inequality. It's like the stuff that you can see coming, right? And so it's important to acknowledge those. Those still exist. We have all kinds of um, scoring systems, for example, um, that are, are trying to um, continue the quantification of social life, but then even have even more consequence for if you're highly ranked or not highly ranked. And so it's very obvious that it's trying to create certain kinds of hierarchies that often overlap with the social groups that we know. 
So that's on one level, one end. And then when you start to go through the chapters, it becomes less obvious and more insidious the way that tech is being employed to um, reinforce social, um, social inequity until you get to techno benevolence, which are these systems and interventions that are not, they're, they're actually trying to do the opposite. They're trying to address bias in various forms. It's like the groups and the companies that acknowledge the problem are like, well, we can create an app for that. We can create a technology for that. And so it's not that we need to be completely cynical about that, but we also have to look carefully at those things which are promised to do good, which are promised to fix everything, and to look critically at that in the way that they might do quite the opposite or they might not meet the promise that they, that they, um, that they offer. And so going through each of those was an exercise for me in trying to make some distinctions while at the same time throughout the book, I'm, I'm much more interested in drawing connections right. and to show you the distinction, the, the way that something that does, is way over here, that doesn't seem related, comes and is connected to something way over here. And so, we, you know, we can talk more about that. Let's talk a little bit more. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and so again, it's like, you know, my training in sociology is like, let's create a, a graph and let's, let's put everything in boxes so that we can categorize everything. Like that's the training, and in some ways I'm I'm running a little bit against that. Although I have these chapter, um, you know, the focus of the foci of a different chapter, I'm also really interested in showing you how the dots connect. It's how something that seems very cosmetic, lighthearted, recreational, is connected to something that's really harmful and damaging. So that it's not really about drawing a bright line between those things. But it's about the, the connectivity, how the logics within those things might be the same, even if the outcome looks different. So one, one example that I talk about that many of you may have seen when you go to YouTube that it had a little circulation a few years ago was when you go to the automated um, sink, you know, and how um, a lot of the, the system, the soap doesn't come out or the water doesn't come out, right? And so partly because of the way it's designed, it does not pick up the darker skin so that the fluid doesn't come out. And so there was a couple of uh, two friends, black and white, who made a video of it. And they're laughing through the whole thing, showing how the soap doesn't come out with a black hand and it got a lot of circulation. And so that seems on the surface like really lighthearted, you know, so what? Just go and get your, you know, just use something else. It's like a, a quick way to deal with that. And so that is on the level of sort of, you know, non-consequential. But when you look at a lot of other automated systems that don't see blackness or only look at blackness, as we did with the, with the clip, and where the context is much more consequential, like we're thinking about facial recognition technologies, for example, or predictive policing that are targeted at black neighborhoods, you know, where the, the relationship between blackness and tech is um, is quite dangerous. And so we could say this is in a category all its own, you know? But for me, it's interesting to think about how the connection, so I have a little, you know, sort of a, a exercise in there that's trying to do what I'm calling thin, thin description, drawing on an anthropologist John Jackson's work, looking at the surface, looking at the connections um, as a way to draw things together rather than cut, every, cut the world up into all of these little categories. There was this moment as I was reading the text um, where you invoked the Black Mirror episode, mm -hmm. Nose Dive. Mm -hmm. And I watched it. <laughs> you did. <laughs> and I couldn't finish it. It was that pain. Mm -hmm. um, Have you guys seen that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So talk a little bit about what Nose Dive yeah. was doing, yeah. is doing. Yeah. Yeah, the brilliance of Black Mirror is it takes something that we do at one level and just takes it one little step forward that's very close to our reality and then shows you where we could end up. And so this is an episode that's focused on, um, you know, an app where in all of our social encounters, we're constantly raiding each other, right? So you serve me coffee and I decide whether you get four stars or five. Um, you open the door for me, and if you open the door with a smile, I give you five. If you don't smile, you get four. If you don't open the door, you get one. All of our social interactions are um, mediated by this technology. 
but the danger is that how many stars you have, whatever your end result is, has major consequences. If you go to rent a, a house or an apartment, depending on your rating, you may or may not qualify, right? And so it's on the level of these superficial encounters have these big consequential um, you know, impacts. And so the main protagonist is going through the episode and she wants to get this great apartment, but her numbers aren't high enough. And then she has to go find people who already have high numbers to rate her highly, because that's how you increase your score. And so it's this quantification of social life. And you know the way that it sort of spirals is she can't get the numbers up. And she eventually, to me, one of the most poignant scenes is she, she runs into someone, she's hitchhiking to this wedding where a lot of high number of people are that she's trying to get rated by. She is hitchhiking and the, the person who is driving the truck, she's opted out of the whole system. She's like, I don't care what my number is. She has like a two something out of, let's say five. And then the main protagonist looks at her and she said, you don't look like a 2.3. And because she does, you know, the idea that if you're a low number and you're completely pathological, sociopath. And it's that moment where something so arbitrary, like these numbers are imbued with meaning, such that the protagonist thinks she should be able to recognize and see it in the, in the person's, you know, demeanor or phenotype. And so I think that is a lesson for us in terms of how something may start out seeming so arbitrary um, that we don't take it seriously. But if we begin, even if a subset of people start to act on it and imbue it with meaning, it takes on a life of its own and can have major consequences and create a new kind of digital caste system as happens in the episode. Well, I know we want to get to you to ask questions, but I think I have two last things. <laughs> really quickly. Yeah. Um, imagination is the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And throughout the text, not only do you use uh, television, mm -hmm. fiction, kind of dystopian world and that, that may, that often is imagined as a result of technology. Um, I know that you organized a conference on Princeton's campus where you brought folk who mm -hmm. write and and do kind of creative work. So I, it would be really mm -hmm. interesting to think, for you to think a little bit more out loud mm -hmm. about what <coughs> the abolitionist work, mm -hmm. the imaginative work, mm -hmm. entails. Yeah. Because it's not just simply this descriptive project that you're doing, right? It's, all, it's, it's imagining a new a different way of being with each other. Absolutely. And then the second question, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I'm sorry I can share that. <laughs> is this is an, this was an amazing journey and this is the other amazing journey mm -hmm. right make me scared of my mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what did you learn yeah where did you end up yeah. uh, after writing this yeah. so those are kind of yeah related yeah they're totally related and the, the answer can actually draw them together and so let me let me answer it by talking about the other book um, because the other book is called Captivating Technology. It's an edited volume in which I draw together amazing scholars working across a range of fields to think together about race technology and carcerality, incarceration. And when I was sort of working with this group and hadn't settled on a title yet, um, I threw out some and they were all, they just rejected them. They're like, no, those aren't good, those aren't good, that's cheesy, uh, go back again. And one of the more senior contributors wrote back in response to the title that I was then playing with, which was one of these titles which was like trying too hard to be like heavy hitting, like oppression, inequality, like everything's bad, like a very sort of, um, you know, expressing the dystopian imaginary very strongly. And one of the things that he said was, you know, we give too much intellectual space. We cede too much intellectual space to the problem and not to our own vision of the world that we want to live in. And it was his way of saying that even in the title, even in the framing, um, we often give over um, our own power, our own imagination to naming the thing that we don't want rather than naming what we do want. 
And in that interaction and reflection and going back and, and trying to weave that reflection into the title and also into the substance of both books, it was a challenge. It was challenging me to um, sort of work against my inclination to only diagnose the problem without offering any sense of what we do about it. Not what we do about it, but what people are already doing about it. That's why I spent time in the, in the presentation naming organizations and efforts who are working in, in the trenches around tech justice, because that's a lesson for me about how we see, in the sense of C-E-D-E, so much of our own power and imagination over to the thing we're against, rather than seed, S-E-E-D, the, the world that we want. And so imagination in the sense of a battlefield means that we can't just battle the dominant imaginary. We have to cultivate counter-imaginaries, right? Because once that thing is torn down, if that's all we know, if we haven't planted anything else, that's what we're going to grow again. And so it matters that we actually put the frame and put the light on those practices that nourish us, that fuel us, that give us joy, that you know do the work of rebuilding, not just um, tearing down. And so that's the import of imagination for all of us. And that's also what I learned through the process of these two books is that um, I can't just diagnose. Right? I have to actually work with people and organizations who are, who are trying to um, make us better. Can we give Professor Benjamin a round of applause? <laughs> he describes this book as a field guide. As a field guide. So it's not only an extraordinary account of the relationship between race and technology and its challenges, but it's also a, a kind of uh, marching mm -hmm. for what we ought to do. So with that in mind, we're going to open it up to the audience uh, because of uh, we need you to talk in the mic. Uh, this could be for anybody, really. Uh, I'm just curious, and you know, as a as a religious leader. Why don't we include or ask the question about religion and race? Because that's where it all starts in religion, believe it or not. Most times, you know, when we taught things, we're taught from childhood. Most of us here are believers in God. But we don't talk about how we came uh, to have racism. But if I told you that everybody was born black, would anybody disagree? It's a question for everybody. If you do, if you do I'll explain to you why I say that question. Yeah, Anybody yeah. disagree that they're born black? Everybody, doesn't white, black, Asian, whatever. Anybody disagree? Yeah. Well, if you don't have to answer, I'll tell you why. When you, when you come to this world, I'm not, I'm not saying this, I'm bringing this to technology, but everybody doesn't know who their parents are when they come to this world. So when you learn something, you're learning picture language. So the picture language that you get is, is, a, is basically picture language, but when you come into the world, all you look for are pictures and not actually what goes on in life. You see, you look at life and you see things in life and you say, okay, well, this is what teaches me about how to become uh, organized as a community. You see the insects, you see the different leaves and trees, different technology that you're learning. But we don't acknowledge God to that, so why don't we acknowledge God? That's my question. No, thank you for that. And, you know, that is a question certainly for um, Professor Blau's last few books, I think, um, would be a starting point to think about the connection between race, religion, and society. And I would say, connecting it back to what I've written, one way to think about it is that in many ways we've imbued science and technology with a kind of faith that it will be able to arbitrate reality. And so science as a new god. Right? And so we think about Weber's work in terms of the Protestant ethic. And so it's not just religion that we have faith in, but there are many other things that we grant power and faith to that are mediating our lives that I think we have to call into question in the way that some are, are questioning um, the power granted to religion as well. So I'll, that's where I'll leave it right now. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I really liked your characterization of this idea of tech benevolence. Uh, so I'm a graduate student here in the computer science department, and it's something I see and worry about sometimes, particularly when people aren't aware that they're doing it, which I guess is the idea. And I wondered uh, if you had any sort of advice for you know, people who are uh, computer science majors or graduate students or in related fields, um, you know, what are the ways of avoiding this and maybe actually being benevolent in the, maybe in the more real sense? Yeah, no, that's a, a really great question too. Um, and I would say, you know, th there's a few things that I think about um, of how to avoid the pitfalls of techno benevolence in the way that I've described it. And one of the, one of the important sort of dimensions of that is to be in relation and situate yourself in the communities that you, you imagine your technology is going to help, rather than closing yourself off in a department or in, in the academy and coming up with solutions in isolation without actually talking with and getting your marching orders from the groups that you're meant to serve and help. It will be a starting point so that your tech fix, um, it, it's very presumptuous often to think about what you're fixing in isolation and not in conversation with the communities that you're, you're serving and you're working with. And so if you just think about that example of abolition versus promise, right, Jay-Z's app versus the other one, what they're both apps. They both have to do with incarceration. They both have to do with trying to decarcerate. But one of the distinguishing factors of abolition is that it's being used in conjunction with organizations that have been in the in doing the work of creating bail funds and working in communities well before the app came along. And so Zeidler actually collaborated with these organizations, and they're the ones who actually go and actually bail the people out with the money. And so that the technology is situated in the social infrastructure that then gives it life and holds it accountable as opposed to Promise, which is venture capital funded and it's sort of in a realm of its own and the communities that it's supposedly helping call it into question, like BYP 100. And so it's thinking about technology not only in terms of the software and hardware, but the social infrastructure, right? Thinking as rigorously about the social relations as we do the ins and outs of any given technology. Oftentimes I find as a social scientist, People, because they're familiar with things like race or things like inequality or bias, there's a way in which uh, our rigor around thinking about those things and how we want to address them, it relies on a kind of common sense. Like everybody knows how to do that. We all know this. As opposed to thinking as seriously and rigorously about the sociality as we do the technicality, right? And so that's part of um, it's a reflection also of the inequities in the academy about which fields and which departments are granted more authority, given more resources. And so it's, it makes sense that someone who would be trained in a STEM field would think they could solve all the world's problems without talking to anyone who's working in communities or even a sociologist who studies those things because that, is, that you're socialized to think of hard sciences versus soft sciences. Even in our nomenclature, we create categories that rank different ways of knowing the world. And so I think part of it, you know, I see happening institutionally is something called um, public, uh, what is it called? Uh, public uh, interest technology, like public interest law. Public interest technology are these centers and organizations that are springing up across both the academy and the nonprofit sector to think about how we want to train people differently within STEM to think about their relationship to various kinds of publics as one example of how our training has to change for these other things that I'm describing. Um, and so I'm really glad that you're thinking about that. And there's a lot happening um, um, at Princeton and beyond to try to begin to, to deal with it at the level of pedagogy and disciplinary. Uh, thank you, Professor Benjamin, for your talk. I thought it was very fascinating. I have sort of a similar question, um, but I think so. You talked a lot about. I found it very interesting. You talked about like um, racism, sort of technology. Is technology productive in some way? There are efforts like abolition and like first find the tech work person someone can like produce new ways to use this technology. But my question is, what is what is sort of the anti-racist plan for like an everyday user of technology? 
because it seems to me like the user is sort of very passively interacting with this this entire you know field yeah. that you're describing. Even the even in like a clip, it's yeah. like users they have no choice but to use the technology. So I wonder what what the counter imaginary is for like an everyday person who just has to exist. Yeah, I mean it's a great question. It's one that. I appreciate when people ask because it's a question that grows out of like wanting to do something as an individual, like right away, right? And so it's an action-oriented question and I really love it. And at the same time, my response is that an individual response to this is inadequate. Uh, the, 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 the desire to individually opt out of certain systems is kind of like, and I've heard my, you know, Professor Glau describe, you know, dealing with climate change by just individually recycling. Right? As opposed to thinking more macro, more in terms of the, the, the big organizations and companies that are complicit and holding them accountable and changing their practices, rather than just thinking we as individuals need to change ours, right? Which it has a role. One story I give in the book is of my colleague in sociology here, Janet Bertessi. And she's a sociologist of technology. I don't think she's here, but I'll, so I'll tell her business. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, write about it. I got permission. Okay. So when she was pregnant, I think her first child, she tried to opt out of these, this sort of digital dragnet and all the ways that what you do online is accumulated and sold and sold back to you in targeted ads. And so she tried to keep anything related to her pregnancy off the internet. She wouldn't let her family post about it. Nothing pregnancy related, right, for nine months. And that also involved, you know, enrolling her husband in this project in which he was, uh, was not allowed to use his credit card to buy baby-related things, because that's also part of it, right? So he would go and buy um, gift cards and then go buy whatever he had to buy. <laughs> and then, so what happened was he was buying so many gift cards that he was flagged as a possible criminal, <laughs> which tells us that the effort of individuals to opt out implicitly is a threat. There's an implicit charge of wrongdoing by trying to opt out of the digital dragnet, which tells us we have to do more than a kind of informed refusal, however important, and there's more kind of options to do things where you don't use WhatsApp, you use Signal, there's different things that people are doing, which is all well and good. But I tend to be more focused on collective action and what we need to do collectively to hold these companies accountable or organizations and governments accountable um, and that involves individual agency, but it's more than just thinking about only what we do with our own screen, and it's thinking about what we need to change so that we no longer even think of ourselves as users. Because as I say, users get used. And so we are more than users. What's happening really is the decisions that are happening behind closed doors in terms of private companies, these are public policy decisions that are happening and, and taking place by people who don't have a mandate who are who we didn't elect, but their decisions have these ramifications in terms of public policy and the public good that I think should begin to have us change our own thinking about ourselves in relation. That you know, who are we? Are we just users, end users who then have to deal with the, the decisions of others, or do we want to try to shape those decisions and hold hold um, you know hold these organizations accountable? And so. That's a roundabout way of saying that, yes, figure out what you can do as an individual in terms of your own specific, you know, um, relation to technology, but also think about collectively what organizations can you support, get involved with in terms of tech justice and other and other things. Thank you so much for your talk. It was, I didn't really know what to expect, honestly, because you think racism, technology, you know, what, what does it all mean? Um, one thing I would like to say, racism enrages me in a way that is just so, like, to my core. Um, and I like to think that if I wasn't a black woman, I would still be just as enraged. I like to believe that. But I kind of think of black people as kind of the beta group when it comes to the pains that technology inflicts on society. And I want to be optimistic like the young man and speak about the Netherlands and people are conscious of that. But I look at white people and I say to myself, racism scares me. Why doesn't it scare you? Because we're the beta group. So 
we're, we're already at the bottom. So helicopters in our neighborhoods, it's it's you're you're five years away from it. So you know, yeah. I, I want to believe, yeah, you know, for moral reasons, mm -hmm. you should be offended. But practical reasons, why aren't you offended? Because you know, I was a kid in the '90s. I remember when Chicago schools were getting shot up and Philadelphia schools were getting shot up and. Everyone was kind of like, la, 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 I'm on my grass on Saturday morning, no big deal. <laughs> and, and, and look where we are now. I remember, I, well, I don't remember the, the, the crack era per se, but, you know, I, I grew up in hip hop. Like, I was there, guys, at the beginning. <laughs> and that was all a reaction to that. So I don't know what white communities will artistically produce because of what they're going through, but it's like racism enrages me. It should really enrage you. Maybe not for the reasons I should hope, just for the moral reasons, the, 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 the ethical reasons, but it should it should scare you because, you know. <sighs> no, thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, there's so there's so much there. And one of the things I, I just want to um, acknowledge is that anger in the way that you're expressing it, it can be productive, you know? And so one of the, in terms of channeling and fueling different types of work and interventions. And so I think the response often when people give voice to that is to try to dampen it somehow and say, well, you know, let's be more reasonable. Let's reason this out and think through. And I think that that's a, that's a faulty response in the way that anger can be actually channeled, um, especially with respect to racism. And so in terms of, you know, the what the white people are doing or reacting, I think that, you know, I, I personally, um, the, the, my little bit of optimism that I have grows out of interactions with my students and seeing, you know, the level of rage and frustration among students of all backgrounds in terms of what the generation before are passing on to them. And so the extent to which I can actually like continue to, you know, um, fan that those emotions and have it channeled into all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of practices and actions, I think is my job, right? I don't know about generations past, you know, and I don't, and I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to convince people and make them as angry as me or enlighten etc because you know that that's them you know that is on them and so you know as much as I appreciate the the focus of that um, I think you know in some ways we have to work with what we have the people who are already about it and just build build from there thank you um, so I'm more interested I'm um, uh, although I completely agree with you like the amount of like the lack of empathy in our societies really disturbing at times, but I'm also curious about um, what you think are potential like technological solutions to more like politically institutional racist um, practices like gerrymandering, voter disenfranchisement. Um, like as someone in my generation, I'm super interested in um, just kind of making things more equal, um, equality of opportunity, um, like criminal justice reform, yeah. but how do you think, from a technological standpoint, like we can kind of mediate? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of the shift that um, I would like to see more of are technologies that are not focused on identifying and predicting individual risk, which is what many of these technologies are designed to do to identify individuals' risk of defaulting on, on a loan or committing a crime or whatever it is, the riskiness of individuals, and actually focus both our social and technical capacity on identifying and intervening in the production of risk by institutions, like political institutions and others. So it's a different way of framing the problem. The problem isn't an individual who might commit a crime, it's the creation of policies that make precarity possible and make it necessary for people to try to etch out a living in various kinds of ways. So it's shifting who, what is the source of the, of the problem that we're trying to address. Because it's at the point of posing a problem, if 
before you even get to designing this technology or this policy, that is where you get the imagination. That is where you get the um, vision of you know what needs fixing. And so, what if we focus less, as the white collar crime um, example shows us, on you know an individual's likelihood to rob that store versus you know the, the inequality in a particular area and the and the the practices of the banks in a place that don't give out loans to everyone, et cetera, et cetera. So it's looking at institutions and their production of risk rather than an individual's response to that context that makes them labeled risky. And so there are a number of, you know, uh, you know different examples that people are trying to work with. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the automation of decarceration. One example was uh, in California where as opposed to the very onerous process of individuals who are trying to get their records expunged, this system allowed with a, a click of a, you know, a key to expunge the records of thousands of people and automated that process of identifying and doing that. And so that's a way of thinking about what's the problem that we're trying to solve, what are we trying to automate? And it requires, you know, a, just a, a different way of posing problems that matters in terms of who is doing the envisioning and who's doing that. that. Uh, Professor Benjamin, thank you so much uh, for your work and your words here tonight. Uh, on that theme, I wanted to ask a little bit about your thoughts on uh, organizations and, and resistance movements that use technology to almost counter surveil the police. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Cop Watch, mm -hmm. Proper Response Networks, denouncing yeah. uh, uh, police raising checkpoints, avoiding stepping into the ground of upper ground railroad yeah. <laughs> uh, traps, and understanding the discretion needed there. But I'm wondering what you think are some of the possibilities for that in the future, whether it's in expanding, if there are any pitfalls uh, to yeah. consider of in developing those technologies. Yeah, and so that's exactly one of the tactics used by Stop LAPD spying, mm -hmm. is that they will go to like a Mayday rally and film and interview police officers and ask them about the technology that they use in communities, get their responses on camera, and cut to footage of the very technologies that the police officers claiming they don't use, actually being used. And editing in this way that you can see that their responses actually run completely counter to what's happening, right? And so they do employ this kind of surveillance, as Simone Brown called it, the kind of watching from below. Um, but similar to what we've seen happen with um, cameras that officers use, just exposing a problem doesn't lead to the, the, the obvious next step that we think people are going to be held accountable. So if you just input a technology that is doing the watching and everything else stays the same, all of the decision makers stay the same, all the rest of the system stays the same in terms of who gets to get off, who gets held accountable, who makes the decisions, then just seeing a problem is not going to necessarily lead to that next step in which people are going to act on it in the way that we might like to imagine. So as much as the kind of seeing from below is one step towards change, if we think that that's the end all be all, that simply putting the camera on the wrongdoers is going to be enough for for um, you know certain kinds of shifts and transformation, um, we have plenty of evidence precedent that shows that's not how how things happen. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that's great. Um, I feel like. This could be like question mush, so I apologize. <laughs> but the um, uh, first um, thing I was thinking about um, was I don't know if you uh, followed the um, some of the um, follow from the proposed Uber ban in New York um, for the reduction of um, Ubers in the city. Was uh, one of the things that Uber listed as one of the reasons that um, the council should not pass the ban was that Uber was this anti-racist technology um, and that they were, you know, giving rides to black people when cabs were not stopping for them and that they were going to neighborhoods that, you know, were, were where more black people live um, at, at rates that cabs were not going to. Um, so how do, we, how, do you, how do we navigate um, these moments where um, something like the possibility for an, uh, you know, anti-racist technology um, bumps up against a, a very different kind of um, yeah. your relation to technology. Um, and maybe like a, a flip side of that question would be something like um, 
how do, how do we also stop or, or, or disrupt the idea that I feel like was, um, you know, sold to us after um, the 2016 election, which was that somehow, like, you know, the technology of automation had been racialized to produce, like, white anger? Like, how, I was thinking about that, too. Yeah. Like, how do we stop this idea that somehow, like, you know, um, this kind of politics of whiteness that is also the result of, you know, automation or technology? Like, how do we sort of make those are two um, dissertation level questions. <laughs> At least master's paper uh, provocations. I'm, I'm gonna, I might get around to the second one, which is, I can, lots of great work being done around that, by the way. But just let's stick with the first one for a second, because it's a really great example of, of a techno benevolent gesture about why this technology is good because it's doing this one thing. And um, one, I believe that there is research to show the way that the app, uh, um, the way that in, in drivers can actually not go to certain areas once they see, you know, where they're going based on the dangerousness or whatever. So there's a way in which it facilitates the old school kind of racism through the app as well. So I think that's one dimension. But I think what the, the way that you framed it and the way that they have sort of framed the promise of it is important because if you only sort of pay attention to one line of re reasoning or one axis and you don't think about it in this larger context and then you can easily sort of drink the Kool-Aid in terms of the tech promise. And I think that one of the important you know, dimensions that you're bringing up is the labor required for automation. Most of the things that we are promises automated, there are people doing the work. Right? There's a, a whole set of labor practices that we want to expose and bring to the fore, whether it's Uber or whether it's just what you see on your computer screen. There's some great work that's been published recently about like content moderators, the people who sit in facilities and remove uh, bad content so it never, you ne it never gets to your screen. And the toll that takes on these people of seeing the worst of the worst that people po uh, post. There's a great new book called Behind the Screen that's based on qualitative research with content moderators. Essentially, these companies um, outsourcing this to you know other companies that hire armies of people to sit in in um, you know warehouses doing this. And there's a film on Netflix called The Cleaners, which focuses on one such um, facility in the Philippines. And so part of what we want to think about is not just our experience as users of an app like Uber or of a search engine, but what is happening behind the scenes, right? Who is being displaced or harmed in terms of the labor practices that make this very, the ease and the efficiency that we might experience possible? We can't divorce our experience from that, the production of these technologies. So if that happens to be sort of putting you know, thousands of taxi drivers out of work. That's, that should be part of the story, right? If it has to do with, you know, a, a warehouse full of people who um, are experiencing severe mental health crises because they're looking at all of these things that they have to screen out, that has to be part of the story rather than seeing that as a separate issue that's not about tech justice, and it is. And so it, it demands, I think, a more holistic analysis and for me, it's grounds for thinking about what solidarity and coalitions might look like in the, in the wake of, um, you know, these, these emerging technologies. So that, again, we don't just think of ourselves as an end user of particular things, but in community, in sociality with the people that produce it, the people that are displaced by it, the people who, in fact, may love it and desire it and are mad that we're having this conversation, right? So all of those perspectives need to converge and conflict and is part of a, a sort of public discourse and debate around this, as opposed to parceling things off in neat little you know, boxes and saying that's this, this issue, that's a, a different issue. And so I'm glad you raised that, and I would really encourage those who uh, have a little time this weekend to look at The Cleaners on Netflix, because it will give you a whole new sense of um, what we take for granted um, when you log on. Please join me in thanking. Okay.